magnets both attract and repel each other. Magnetic materials don't interact with each other, but magnets attract them, cause them to act like magnets. A magnet has a north and south pole. Like poles repel, and unlike poles attract. No matter how many times a permanent magnet is cut, it will always have a north and south pole. Thus, poles occur in pairs. Permanent magnets have high magnetic fields and can remain magnetized when other forces act against it. It also retains its magnetization when all other forces are removed. Electrons in permanent magnets orbit and spin. The properties of many materials are explained in terms of a model in which an electron spins on its axis. The spinning electron represents a change in motion that produces a magnetic field. In atoms containing many electrons, the electrons usually pair up with their spins opposite each other. This cancels out their magnetic fields. That is why most substances are not magnetic. However, in certain materials such as iron, cobalt, and nickel, magnetic fields don't cancel out completely. This is because they have lone electrons, making them magnetic. Domains are created when strong coupling occurs between neighboring atoms to form large groups of atoms whose net spins are aligned. In a non-magnetic material, no domains exist. In magnetic materials, domains exist, but they are not aligned. In magnets, all domains are aligned. Hard magnetic materials have domains that stay aligned after the external force is removed, resulting in a permanent magnet. In soft magnetic materials, once the external force is removed, the random motion of particles changes the orientation of the domains and the material returns to an unmagnetized state. Magnetic alloys are usually magnetically hard. They solve the problem of magnetic softness and can be used for a wide variety of applications. This is a magnet made of Alnico 5, an alloy used to create especially strong magnets. This type of alloy is commonly used in things like microphones and electric guitar pickups. However, certain rare earth magnets, such as neodymium, are stronger. In fact, they're the strongest type of permanent magnet commercially available. These magnets have replaced Alnico magnets in many areas. They're used in many things such as hard disk drives and loudspeakers. A solenoid is created when an insulated wire is bent into a coil of several closely spaced loops and a current is run through it, creating a magnetic field. The magnetic field can be increased by inserting an electromagnet through the coil. Earth is essentially one gigantic magnet. Because of this, compasses work. A compass is essentially one really small magnet on a nearly frictionless pivot point. One end of the compass will always point towards Earth's magnetic north. The magnet in the compass must be really small because the magnetic field around Earth is so weak due to Earth's size. The magnetic field is a region where a magnetic force can be felt, and we draw them like this. The magnetic field always travels from the north end to the south end. <laughs> In 1820, a guy named Hans Ostead, looked like this, he discovered that compasses move in relation to electricity, and this is because electricity creates a magnetic field. He did this experiment where he took a compass right here and placed it under a wire in which he ran electricity through it. He then discovered that the compass would move and not point to Earth's magnetic north anymore. This led him to find that electric currents create magnetic fields. Through this finding, he invented the right-hand rule, 
which shows the direction of the magnetic field in relation to the electric current. The current of your right hand is your thumb. So if the current is moving up, then the magnetic field, which is represented by all four of your other fingers, will curl around and travel in the direction of your fingers. Charged particles have a similar rule called the left hand rule. A charged particle moving in an electric field will always feel a force if it is moving across a field. It will feel a force. If it's traveling along the field or just staying stationary, it will not feel a force. But if it's moving across, we can find the direction of the force felt by it using a left hand rule. The left hand rule goes like this. Your pointer finger or your index finger is, represents the direction of the electric current. Your thumb represents the direction of the magnetic field. And your middle finger, which goes like this, up sideways, will represent the direction of the force felt by the charged particle moving in the magnetic field. And that's the left hand rule. Electromagnetic induction is the process of inducing a current in a circuit with a changing magnetic field. If neither the magnet nor the circuit is moving with respect to the other, no current will be present in the circuit. However, if either is moved, a current is induced. The relative motion creates an electromagnetic field that is equivalent to a battery with a potential difference between its terminals. Michael Faraday was the scientist primarily responsible for this discovery. His experiment involved quickly sliding a bar magnet in and out of a coil of wire, and he saw transient currents. Motors basically work like this. You have a coil of wire in between two magnets, one north end, one south end, and this is going to be attached to a battery. The battery is going to spin the coil of wire, and one end of this wire is attracted to the south end and one attracted to the north. So it's going to spin so it's attracted, and then the commutator is going to turn the current off and then reverse it so that it'll be attracted to, so that this end will now be attracted to this end after it has spun over here. And it will cause motion and then you can use this to power other objects such as a propeller. And that just spins a propeller like that. And that's how a motor will work. So a generator basically works in reverse of a motor, so instead of having a battery power the motion of the coils of wire inside a magnet, which will cause the propeller to spin, the propeller is spun by something like wind or water, and then that will cause these to spin, which will cause an alternating current to be induced into the, into the battery, and that will power the battery, which we can use for other things. So transformers basically work like this. Wire and you introduce an alternating current into it and you have more coils on the secondary coil and you get more coils over on the secondary side and you can put out more voltage than you get in because more coils equals a greater voltage in the electric current. We use transformers every day to transport electricity from the power plant to our houses. So we use transformers when coming from the power plant to amp up the voltage so that it can travel easier and it goes across all the power lines and then right before we go into our house you see them on telephone poles all the time and this amps it down so that it's safe to enter our house and doesn't harm us when we turn on a light or power our microwave. I have a transformer that amps up the voltage and I can show you how it works on a Jacob's ladder. A primary wire which is going to go into the transformer but you can't see it because it's a big box. So it's going to go into the transformer and then we have the secondary wires coming out and this is a step up transformer, so it's inputting 120 volts and outputting 14 kilovolts, which is approximately 117 times more wire coils on the secondary wires. So it's going to do some cool stuff with this Jacob's letter. Einstein's theory of special relativity states that the laws of physics are the same for all non-accelerating observers. Basically, he said that the speed of light is the same for everyone no matter where you are measuring it. This means that one observer can view events at one time and another observer can view the same events at a different time.
Einstein did a thought experiment which looks a little bit like this. Here we have observer B is up in a train and he has a beam of light here that is bouncing between two mirrors and both of them can measure the speed at which the light is traveling. Both observers are going to measure the light traveling at the same velocity. If the train starts to move, then this observer is not going to be the light traveling at any different velocity because he's moving with it. Observer A is also going to view it at the same velocity but at a different time. Velocity equals time times the change in distance. Since they're both going to observe light traveling at the same speed, that means that these have to change in their ratio. But since delta x is changing, both velocity has to stay the same, that means that time must also change. So he, observer A, is going to view the light bouncing at a slower rate. Let's try another experiment to show Einstein's theory of special relativity. If we observe two non-moving electrons, we would see them repel each other. But since moving charges create magnetic fields, moving electrons won't entirely repel each other. They will create magnetic fields as they're moving, and they will repel and also attract. Since their repelling forces are going to be greater, they're just going to repel at a slower rate. So if we are if we are standing stationary observing the moving electrons, we will notice them repelling at a slower rate than we would if they were if they were also stationary. But if we are moving at the same speed as the electrons, we're only going to view them repelling. <laughs>